so first of all, thanks for being here. Uh, we're very excited to bring this uh, very exciting topic for us that happened this year. Uh, we've been already telling the story a bit, but today we have some additional uh, special material for you. Uh, particularly, we started working on some of the detections and some recommendations of how you can go and, and, and try to find this type of malware, particularly if, if, if you're passionate about going and searching for it. And for this, um, well, before getting into the story, I, I just wanted to do a quick introduction. Uh, right now, you're going to see, I am Daniel, uh, technical um, analysis manager in the Mandian team with working with Cyberphysical, with I.O. And uh, you're also going to see here Ken Proska. He's uh, one of our star analysts uh, from the Cyberphysical team. Both of us and all of our team was involved in, in this particular research. Ken might not be coming here right now for uh, some unfortunate circumstances that are happening right now. Uh, but he's going to be around here. So if you see, if, if you have questions about detections, mainly threat hunting and whatnot later, that you want to get super in the, in the weeds, please try to find him. I'm pretty sure he's going to be super excited of chatting with you. Now, let's get into the talk directly. So the first thing, industrial control systems malware, something new. This was very exciting for us. Well, and, and, you know, the, the first thing is, why is it so exciting? Uh, because it has happened only a few times. So whenever we see one of these cases, basically, uh, as, as far as we, when we were made aware that it existed, all of our team, it's almost like you drop the things to the floor and immediately you start going into how are we going to tackle this malware? How are we going to find uh, what it is? Let's go and try to do some detection. Let's try to figure out what's going on. You will understand a bit more why it, it is so complicated uh, to, to work with this type of malware. But yeah, that was something we were very excited about this year and very unexcited because of the implications, which also are going to be discussed through the talk. So, uh, as I mentioned a second ago, um, OT malware, uh, industrial control systems malware, or you, you, you prefer, is very fairly complex to identify. Even if you're looking for it all the time, it's not a matter always of how good you look or where you're looking at, but simply a matter of whether it exists and whether you're able to find it or to find, you know, through the different steps of an attack. So historically, based on the difficulties of finding this and, and even that the, how rare it, it is, we have only seen it a couple times. This, is, this timeline is basically like the full history of control system security. Um, first, you know, Stuxnet. Most people in here, if not everyone, is already familiar. Uh, Iranian nuclear centrifuges. Basically, there's a specific malware. Uh, it had more like worm-like capabilities. It moves through the, the, the target's environment and eventually uh, drops the production for a while. Then the next years, based on this, there was more research. Like people started getting excited. Let's go and investigate. Let's figure out what it is. And then uh, we started seeing like how, what are vulnerabilities for control systems? How does it look like? What is it that we are facing? And we started seeing then uh, the, the, the first cases, right? Like, like the blackouts in, in Ukraine, two of them. Uh, one of them with fairly complex malware called Indestroyer. Uh, this is going to be something very important because uh, we're just going to mention it like briefly, but it came back in 2022, which is uh, why I mentioned they're both InController and Indestroyer, the second version. Um, and well, 2017 Triton, that was the, basically the biggest case we've seen uh, so far uh, that was actually deployed on the target that we were able to attribute and whatever. Uh, if you're curious about any of these cases, mainly a Triton, Feel free to go and take a look at our blogs. We have some very good materials. Or let me know, and I'm glad to, to share a bit more. But right now, we're going to be focusing on InController, the, the newest case, which is uh, basically a set of tools uh, to target control systems uh, in, in possibly specific environments, possibly not. And uh, the first question that always comes is, how do you find it? How do you know it exists? You know, it hasn't been deployed. So does that make sense? I know it's pretty tricky. But uh, basically, what we can say is we do we utilize, we, we employ many different techniques to try to identify malware. And gladly, some of these uh, basically bear fruits. Uh, we were able to learn about this malware somehow and eventually started looking into it. And as soon as it came, given the complexity and given all the different types of assets and basically everything that it involves, we started working with um, uh, equipment manufacturers, basically like with all other parties involved. Particularly here, we, we highlight uh, Schneider Electric. Uh, there are some devices that were uh, related to, well, affected by this malware. And, you know, they jumped immediately, were very nice to work with us. We started 
getting up some ideas and, and f trying to figure out what, what was going on. But if you want more sources, if you have them there in this slide, uh, you know, I know all of this is going to go public, so, you know, or let me know, and I'm, I'm pretty, pretty good to share. So, in controller, what is it exactly? In controller is a set of tools, particularly three tools, and we include here two mm, sort of possibly related uh, IT malware, which are the, the, the two in red in the, uh, below on the screen. So, we're going to be focusing mainly on the first three but we kept those just to highlight that an attacker that wants to employ a tool such as in controller will need to use some IT tools to get to move through the target. So the three core components, Tagron, uh, Code Call, Omshell, are basically, uh, we, we, we tried to add, uh, add him in sort of an order of, 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 of um, how the attack will look like. You're gonna see a diagram in a second. But basically the first one, Tagron, uh, is mainly possibly seems to be like a reconnaissance tool that is going to be interacting with a protocol that's called OPC UA. OPC UA is a protocol used to interact with devices in the production side and basically make all that information readable for the machines that we normally work with. The other two, Code Call and Omshell, uh, are instead more like modules that you would use during an attack. When you actually want to interact with the controller, actually make some change in the physical process. Uh, the first one uh, specifically involves a Modbus protocol involves some Schneider Electric uh, devices, and then the second one, Omron devices particularly, and a proprietary protocol called FINS. We're gonna be discussing more of those, and also HTTP, which is fairly weird for the case of control systems, but uh, you, know, you can find a lot of things like that. So this is, this is the thing that we're the most proud about. When, when, we, when we started looking into it, you, know, uh, you have a ton of uh, folders, a ton of files, everything is out of order, and we're trying to figure out what, what's going on. So the first thing is figuring out what modules were the ones that were relevant for the control system, trying to make sense of everything, and then putting it together and trying to figure out what, what is it that, that they even wanted, you know, because it has so many different components and pieces. And so we sat down as a team and came up with this, this diagram that basically illustrates how it could be used through an attack or separately. Uh, later, I was uh, very glad to see that other organizations were also reproducing uh, derived versions from this, from this diagram. Uh, so apparently it was well received. The point in here is what you see is on the top, you have uh, Tagron, which was the one I was mentioning for OPC. On the bottom, you have Code Call and Omshell. This diagram, how you see kind of like um, vertically uh, oriented, is something we call the, the Purdue model in, um, in, for OT control systems. And what it shows is the full architecture of the full structure as an organization of how you would be seeing the different systems that are operating. So it, the, when you go up to the top, you're gonna see more like corporate, basically all the computers that we work with. When you start going down, you start getting into process data, coming out of the process, trying to block, you know, some the military zone and whatnot. When you go to the end, you start getting devices that are, so to speak, less clever. And it's gonna be like the controllers. They are very specific functionalities, very consistent, but are gonna have less logic in place. And uh, finally, well, actuator sensors basically interacting with the process, gathering information from the physical world and whatnot. This is how we think that uh, an attacker might be able to use this, either separate or together. So to put it, uh, let's say to decompose, this first component that is at the Tagron one, most likely would be used for reconnaissance, for gather gathering information of what, what assets do they have, uh, what are the tags for those assets, what is information about the process, uh, how is it running, basically learning everything from what they want to target. And then once they go from there, you get to the second portion below, where is the, the actual, the real attack, uh, where you actually want to, you can generate, uh, we're gonna discuss some scenarios, but basically something like sabotage, something like disruption, and even physical disruption, depending on how the actor is gonna deploy this. Because, just to clarify, uh, this is not like something that you run and it happens, just like, for example, in Stuxnet. This is something that requires to have an operator. So if you came to the beginning, uh, the first talks, for example, we're talking about that, how the adversary operations, how normally right now have some actor behind. So all of this is going to necessarily have uh, at least a lot of very skilled, skillful people that know from OT and from IT how to move all across this. The other two small pieces, the ones that I'm trying not to mention because they are IT malware, but they seemed kind of related. Well, those two, for example, are the type of what we see every day that might be used by the attacker to get to this point and then start deploying the attack. So now, 
Before moving into more in detail, I know that the idea here is getting more into the weeds, um, but we wanted to begin by just adding a very quick summary. To summarize in controller, what, what it is in, in general, so that you can leave from here already saying, like, I can grab a beer and talk about in controller without any problem. Um, first of all, it's large and complex uh, code. It's a ton of information. It's not uh, just one script that runs and, and, and perfect. It's rather a bunch of different uh, components that are going to be operating uh, either together or separate. Second thing, um, it is nothing that you could just use as itself, but rather something that the attacker needs to deploy with the help of additional IT tooling. So most likely they have to go and compromise the, the victim environment, from there move to wherever they can deploy, and then use, it, it's something that they're going to use in response to how the environment works. Not just that you can deploy and, you know, uh, Basically, it has, it has this level of complexity. The next one is that it targets devices that are using automation uh, across different industries. So some of the publications for InController uh, in different places have said, for example, uh, that maybe this was something about uh, oil and gas, that this was about, uh, I don't know, um, I forgot the name. Well, anyway, any other industry, particularly energy, whatever. At this point, it's very difficult to tell because as we were working with the vendors, they were telling us the devices that we're, we are using can be used in many different uh, organizations and can also be deployed in machinery without you even knowing it exists. So for example, a random case that we found was a printing press that is using some of these controllers. Some of those cases, it's gonna be tricky to know where it was going to be deployed or what it was meant to do. Uh, so at this point, the only thing we can do is, is you know, to make some, some logical, some educated analysis, but it's difficult to tell, and that is also why it's so important, right? Because the learnings from here might prevent actual attack in the future. Um, the next thing, very likely state-sponsored. We haven't done any formal attribution. We can't go and tell you it was here or here, unlike in other cases. But we have some educated guesses and some additional information that we're going to give later in the talk. And then finally, the capabilities. As I mentioned, you can have disruption, sabotage, uh, physical destruction. Uh, but, you know, it depends on how it is deployed. And for this, uh, another thing in the, in the summary is that we wanted to highlight like the big three things from this malware that makes it so interesting from an OT perspective. Um, it is that it is showing some sort of evolution or some sort of change. What happens here is, well, first of all, the malware is reusable. When we were thinking many years ago about something like Stuxnet, it was something that's deployed. It's one very well-known victim. You can develop detections, you can go and find it. It's something that you possibly can't use a lot. But in this case, each of these modules can be reused. Uh, it depends more on the victim, what type of uh, devices, what type of assets they have, what are they doing, do I have any visibility, do I not? It depends more on the actions of the actor, and they can go and deploy, making minor modifications. The second one is that it's extensible. So basically, it wasn't built only to, uh, let's say, to stay as it is. Uh, most likely, if we see it in the future, it might be targeting more assets, it might be more complex, Maybe they're going to add some additional logic, some additional modules. Uh, it depends. It is basically like, like how it's uh, developed, enables it to continue growing and to have more capabilities. And this is very similar to what we saw a couple of years ago with Indestroyer, the, the, the one in Ukraine in 2016. It was also had different modules for different protocols. So this type of malware has the capability of you know, continuing to be used. It's not something we can only use uh, basically signatures to go and find. And finally, operating. Um, Basically, as, as, as I was mentioning, it's nothing that you just run and then it happens, but rather it's something that is going to require an operator to sit down or many operators to sit down and go and figure out their way through the, uh, through the attack. Now, a question that we get at this point always is, is in controller coming back? Um, are we going to see it? You know, because right now you disclose all this information. Everyone knows it. Does that mean that we won't see it? Like, you know, for example, a Triton, where you get all the information, and then it's really very difficult to see it again. In this case, unfortunately, it's uh, likely that we're going to see it in the future. It is something, at least, that, that we believe. Obviously, no one knows. But given the characteristic that I said a second ago, the fact that it, it's extensible, that you can deploy it in different ways, that you can separate and just use some of the tools, that you can expand to different capabilities, basically, it is something that if... Uh, whomever was developing this decides to deploy it in the future, they still can. And finding it is not going to be easy 
even if we have disclosed any information, if we have put all the research, the only thing we can do is try to get some learnings, some best practices for threat hunting, for detections that we can uh, move to try to find this activity. And that is why we are trying to bring this up here. Now, before getting to the detections part is going to be in the end, which is actually my favorite right now. That's actually by, by Ken's authorship that, that he's right now, unfortunately, not being able to talk. But he built all that amazing research for, for the end. Uh, but right now, the first thing I want to do is get into um, the tooling, more, more in, a bit more into detail. Because I know we, we just said it's super high level. And you know, it might, might be good to, to share more details. So the first one, about Tagron, uh, as I was mentioning, it goes specifically for uh, targets OPC UA. This protocol that converts and, and enables to communicate automation, uh, machinery, and uh, computers, basically, machine code. Uh, it has the capability of looking and scanning for IP addresses, going and finding the different tags, going and finding what assets are running, getting information of the process, even modifying some of these tags. So basically, it has some very interesting capabilities that are more on the reconnaissance side. Uh, if we were to compare this, there's another case, uh, I believe 2014, something that's called um, Peace Pipe, we call it, I think Habex. It would be kind of similar in that sense, that it was OPC and it wants to get information, wants to get uh, reconnaissance, try to figure out how to go and move to the victim. So from a certain perspective, this is the least sensitive, uh, but it's the one that's going to enable the actor to do anything in the first place. So still very important to, to find it. The second one is uh, for cold call. As I was mentioning, this one is more, it goes, uh, actually tries to do an attack. So it has a capability to connect to the PLC, again, basically trying to, to sign up to, to use it. And um, basically, well, scan for devices. And we mentioned something here, very specific, echo structure, ex I'm gonna pronounce it terrible, I'm sorry, my Spanglish, echo structure, machine expert, or some machine. That is a protocol that is proprietary by uh, Schneider Electric. But what is very interesting about this is that it, it, it's based uh, upon something that's called COSIS, which is a very difficult to explain sort of software suite that, can do, that has many capabilities upon which you can build for interacting with controllers and that many products actually are using. So by the fact that the actor developed this malware with the capability to interact with this echo structure and whatnot, it also means that it might be effective with other controllers that we are not mentioning here and or to be expanded to interact, for example, with other type of codes components, which in a minute you're going to see how, how large that is. Um, the other thing is it, is it can basically mimic what we call here workstation. So workstation in, in plain, plain version is our fancy name for saying a computer, but basically a computer that interacts with your PLC and that tells you what to do can gather and push information, execute code. Um, so basically, it can mimic that workstation, interact with the PLC, and then uh, it has a couple of attack commands. We mentioned here the denial of service. It can break it and uh, basically delay data. Uh, those, that's actually interesting because it already basically owns, it can already interact with the PLC, but also it's trying to disrupt its functioning. So it might give you that idea by, by, by seeing how broad the capabilities are that what the actor is building is not something for once or for a specific case, but rather they want to be prepared. They want to be able to just modify something, modify the logic, they might just want to delete, maybe I want to do a DOS. You know, it has all the different capabilities which normally we don't see uh, for control systems malware. If you're wondering how these devices look like, like when we say it's fairly specific, it's because it is. There are a couple boxes that we have in here. These were the specific devices that, that we saw referenced in the code. Um, what's interesting, for example, is uh, mainly there, there was a module for the TM251, but it had some mentions for the others, particularly the TM258, for example. There were some hard-coded credentials, basically, trying to use some, some, some username. And the reason why this is also interesting is it's almost even difficult to understand what, what they were actually meaning to do in here. Because, uh, for example, that username is actually comes from an older version of the TM251. So you start talking with the vendor, and even th they were like, you know, I don't know what. May maybe they were they maybe they were just working on a lab environment, and there was no target at all, and th that's just what they had, and they are trying to figure it out the same way. Or maybe they saw this in a specific environment, and there's a specific target that might be using this type of of credentials. Who knows? It just that is what we, what we identified, so we can make reference to some specific assets 
uh, based on the module that they have. Um, as I mentioned a second ago, the, one of the interesting things is the code CSV3 that, upon which echo structure is, uh, is built, which means that other devices can also um, you know, be targeted to, to this malware. And the same with Modbus. Uh, if you're familiar with Modbus protocol, that's actually one of the, um, I would say, one of the, if not the most popular, used for industrial um, um, communications. And, well, the fact that it uses Modbus, even though it doesn't use it for an attack, but just to communicate with the PLC, means that it can communicate likely with other PLCs. You might do small changes in the code, but the point is, it has the capability to expand. Now, I, we decided to add a bit more of codes in this, in this case, because we realized that it's actually quite mysterious. If you go right now and try to understand it pretty much in depth, it might be a bit tricky, actually, because obviously it's something proprietary, it's not open and whatnot. And there is only one paper that I'm aware of from Kaspersky, where actually they reverse engineered everything, they were explaining everything, and of course the vendor was like, hey, guys, what are you doing? Come on, this is not nice. And now it's all redacted, basically. So you can read a couple lines and everything is, you know, it looks almost like a, like a government document. Um, so basically, uh, yeah, it, it's difficult to, to know about it, so we wanted to do some research and, and share a bit of, of the awareness of what the implications of this are. This, is, this diagram is something that you're going to see more or less how it works. Basically, you have your engineering workstation, you have your machine. It might be running code sys, uh, the development system. Like I was saying, it's, it's more like a software suite where you can develop different capabilities to have a machine interface, to interact with your PLC, to push information from your machine. And basically, yeah, this would be interacting with the PLCs and then the PLCs uh, directly with, the, again, sensors, actuators, the, the, the common uh, structure that we have. Uh, but yeah, basically, what's very interesting about code sys is uh, if you actually go and just look for public information, this is actually what, what, what they have. So what they uh, have mentioned is that, you can see here, I mean, this is obviously is, is from the vendor. I quote direct, directly in there. They mentioned here several million compatible devices. Is that true? Yes or not? Most likely, yes. And that's the point. That actually when you're developing cap capabilities to interact with this type of um, I'm going to say, again, software development environments. Um, you, you can actually have the potential to go in and, and impact more devices because also oftentimes code sys might be running on devices without you knowing it. Uh, you know, when you buy one of these products, they don't tell you, we built A, B, and C, and it's based on this vendor and this vendor and this vendor. It would be almost impossible to track. Mainly, it might be big machinery. You can't really track all of that. So it's one of the big challenges from a supply chain perspective. And actually, this has triggered some industry talks of like, hey, you know, what are we going to do? Can we start tracking this type of um, implementation, you know, of different products upon each other? But yeah, so that is the impact that we see from CodeCall. And now we go to the third one, Omshell. Omshell was also very interesting because when you think of, uh, you know, a spe specific industrial vendors, Omron is not the first one that comes to your mind. Um, like there are others, like 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 Schneider. You know, like we've seen Siemens. You know, the, the ones that are like like the largest, like by by market. And this time they decided to go specifically for 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 this um, for this type of controllers from from Omron. What's interesting in this code is what it does is it has well. First of all, it works with different protocols. Um, the first one is Fins, Omron Fins. It's proprietary. And what it does, it, it goes and actually tries to search for any PLCs by pulling them using fins. If you're curious about that, yes, you can find fins uh, in the internet. If you do show down Google Dorks or whatever is your favorite, you can find some of this. Um, so first of all, it looks via fins. And then once it finds a specifically, well, it looks for specific devices. It, it basically queries based on MAC address that it, it has to be the devices they want. And once it finds it, what it tries to do is, is it enables you to connect via HTTP and also turn on port 23 telnet, basically, so that you basically it enables you to uh, communicate fully with the device. It's basically getting access. Uh, it also has, like in cold call, it has some additional, let's say, disruptive type of capabilities. They might or might not have to use them, but you know it contains them. And another interesting thing here is uh, the servo, servo module, uh, read, write data. What is a servo? Servo is basically, I'm going to say, like a very precise type of uh, motor, or basically a very precise type of small appliance. And what it does is basically it enables you to have very precise motion for something you want to do, possibly, for example, for automation in a factory or, or whatnot. And the point is, they went specifically, 
uh, well, they included in, in one of the modules this uh, capability to go for this servo, R88DI1SN10F, blah, blah, blah. So sorry that I didn't remember that, right? Uh, but the point for that is there, if I recall well, I think like 22 different versions of the R88D, and specifically they decided to go for this one. So that's again what makes you think maybe there is a specific victim or maybe there is a laugh behind, but they had very specific thing in mind. And the idea is, the, the other thing they had was um, this NJ501 and X1P2. What we did, or well, actually what like, like our, our malware analysts did, is that they went back and started looking into these uh, specific um, controllers. And he, they, they started trying to check like, okay, well, which ones communicate the HTTP? Because it's not all, all, all the range naturally in, in control systems. And we were only able to identify these two ranges for NX and J series that have many different types of controllers. So for now, our theory is that basically the malware is targeting this full series. And you know, we know that these this particular cases were, were included in the, in the malware, basically. Um, there might be more, though. You know, uh, Finding this documentation from the vendors is, is not easy. Obviously, they are not just making it public everywhere. So it takes a bit of uh, skills, dorking, searching around, and we find the manuals and start taking a look. Uh, later during the detections, you're going to see some more, some more of that, that looking around. Uh, as I mentioned, Omshell main protocol is HTTP. That's uh, one of the most interesting things. Uh, yeah, because it, it's you know fairly common. So again, it's only going to use fins uh, to find the controllers. It's going to use HTTP to start interacting. And finally, for as, as for the details of the of the malware, these are the other two uh, small pieces or components that I mentioned at the beginning that purposefully, again, I'm not getting super into. Uh, we just add them there for context because they seem to be related, possibly. It's possible that the actor is going to use this either for this or another attack. But you know, it's basically a regular backdoor uh, exploiting a vulnerability. Uh, there's one of these drivers, for example, is often used in machines that, can't, that are used, uh, for example, for machine interfaces, in industrial purposes. But it is unclear. I would definitely. The, the focus from, from our perspective, from industrial, is definitely on the, on the other three tools. So now, we understand well the malware, we understand the concept, we know where the controller came from. Now, a bit of the, we, we can get you know, our, our tin hats and start getting up in the, in the discussions of what does this mean, where is it coming from. The first one, in controller, very likely state sponsored. Given the complexity of the malware, that's, that's the first thing that we're going to say. The malware is super complex. As we said, it has a ton of different components. That basically, it's something that you can't just sit down, grab a cup of coffee, and do on your own. You might need knowledge about different, different components, about different vendors, about uh, how those uh, factory work, about how am I going to deploy this. And basically, this requires a ton of resources. Uh, and, and you know, we can validate it simply by all the resources it takes from us to go and look into this. When I said in the beginning that our team threw everything you know, to the ground and started doing this, I really mean it. Like The work you're seeing here is nothing that I was doing on my own, is nothing that Ken was doing on his own, is something that all of our team was doing together and we were just adding in the different pieces. Um, and yeah, well, in the end we come with this very, very precise, very precise information. Now, the other thing is in controller does not, we did not find any overlaps. In, in, in code, we did not find any overlaps and similarities, anything with any other malware we had seen before. So again, this does not help us from an attribution perspective. Uh, the fact that there's a lack of victims, at the, the known victims at the moment, that is another thing that makes it difficult. But we have limited circumstantial evidence that, that points toward like, like Russian Nexus. And I highlight, it is super circumstantial. We have a couple extra details that unfortunately we cannot present, but the big thing like, that I'm going to leave from the attribution perspective is more like it's your choice. You decide where it comes from, if it makes sense, if not. But we decided to make it you know, kind of like more interactive with uh, an actual timeline of what we have seen uh, from an OT perspective, like where the interest has been coming from, what are the cases we've been observing. If you realize, uh, actually, most of these cases overlap with the first slide with the historical things. Basically, we have Triton, we have the um, uh, outages in Ukraine, and uh, um, I mentioned also the first one, the peace pipe, that was uh, basically a reconnaissance for OT, particularly OPC, similar to Tagron. 
some extra in here that's interesting. Uh, 2017, Temp Isotope. That's another interesting one that we haven't mentioned, but it was reconnaissance campaign in energy uh, facilities. Ag again, in that case, we actually attributed to specific actors. That case, for example, was very interesting because you can ask me, how do you know that they are interested in OT? Well, we know because we actually reproduced some of the data that they pulled, and it was actually basically a machine interface, OT data, and whatnot. Um, and you know, also the type of organizations they go by, many other things. And finally, uh, here, the last one is, is actually when it got interesting, again, like 2022, the other case that I, that I mentioned uh, in the beginning, I don't know if you remember, in Destroyer, second version, that one, we saw it also this year. We haven't attributed either, but it's exactly the same code that was used by Sandworm in uh, 2016 for the outages. They just literally popped one of the modules and tried to deploy and basically changed some IP address in there. So this is actually where it becomes very interesting in, in from, a, from a big picture perspective of, of OT malware. And it's the fact that what you have here is in controller is what we're discussing right now. In Destroyer version 2 is a mysterious malware that we are not describing right now. We're not going to get into that. But what I wanted to highlight is that both cases that happened in 2022 also, uh, they, they, they share a lot of these capabilities of what we said that was new in OT malware, which was the fact that, uh, for example, if you want to run in controller, you can just choose one of the modules. You can probably change some of the devices, focus on the ones you need for your target. If you want to use uh, in Destroyer version 2, you switch the IP address, you switch the path. We published a blog on that showing how they tried to go after different victims. So as you can tell, both of them actually are going to be reusable. Both of them require an operator. It's something that you just don't deploy. And both of them are extensible. In Destroyer uh, version 2 shows how from an In Destroyer very large, very complex code like style in controller, they could only pop one of the components and then deploy and try to, to have you know, a successful attack that gladly was, was identified by Ukrainian government and whatnot before, but you know, it was possible. It's exactly the same what we have within controller. You can use it as all together, or you can strip one of this and use it and build your own attack based on whatever your victim is. The second thing are the attack scenarios. For attack scenarios, OK, we have three things. We were, we were wondering, what is it that the actor wants to do? And we, we order them, actually, in how we consider them to be, of how sensitive they are considered to be. And the first one is uh, disrupt controllers, shut down operations. Recently, there have been all this talk about, for example, ransomware cases, right? That someone deploys ransomware, industrial organization, production goes down. Basically, you lose money, you lose time, you can't deliver to your customers. Basically, that's something that could be reproduced with this type of malware. If you, for example, shut down some specific controllers, uh, you might, for example, use some of those capabilities to DOS or to crash or whatnot. Or you might simply, you know, modify how they are working in such a way that they force you to turn off uh, operations. And it might either take you a lot of time to bring them back, or maybe it might mess up some of your, pro your production. Or, you know, basically, there are many different ways to do this. The second one is sabotage. Uh, for sabotage, we always think about this is this really theoretical. Uh, I mean, like, I don't think there are many famous cases of, of something like that, but uh, sabotage, basically, we're talking about, you know, you have to be very precise with your production. So what happens if I modify some of the parameters and you produce something that is not useful, then you're basically going to mess up your batch and possibly your product. Depending on what the product is, it's going to be more or less sensitive. But in the end, you know, again, a loss. And the most relevant, like, which is always the most relevant for control systems and the worst case for a cyber attack, is basically physical destruction. The point in here is if you modify how these controllers are working, uh, let's say in an informed way in which you know that it's going to affect the process, then you might lead to physical destruction. So to give an example, it might be that this NX and J, they have some controllers that are used for some safety functions. So if you, if you probably turn off one of those uh, controllers for safety functions, then you don't have that backup whenever a process changes. Then you force the process to change because you can also interact with the, let's say, in this case, the cold call ones, the Schneider Electric. Then you modify the process. There is no safety behind. Basically, that's how you would get to a physical destruction. But again, as you can tell, all of this is, you know, it's kind of like in our brains how we try to do this analysis. And it is precisely because of how much interaction it requires with the actor. Really, the tools are amazing. It's, it has a lot of work behind, but it's going to definitely depend on the skills of the actor and how they can use them. And then, to begin all these attacks, of course, to finish the picture, 
that's where uh, Tagron would be. Tagron would be doing basically uh, fulfilling the purpose of uh, reconnaissance, of gathering all the information they need to be able to do one of the scenarios that I was discussing in a second. That is basically what we could do from, um, yeah, I didn't want to get that yet, but this is basically what, we're, what, we, what we have from, from a tax scenario perspective. As you can see, three very concerning scenarios. And so, um, until now, that's basically what we had built. Right now, we want to add some additional detail on hunting and detections. Uh, parenthesis, that image comes from one of our peers. Uh, for some reason, he has 11 snakes. No one knows why, but they are amazing. And we always use these pictures. And this time, on purpose, we wanted to bring that picture differently from the cats that are just fun. Uh, because right now, we actually want to focus on one point, uh, on Python, actually. It's going to be one of our big topics right now for detections, something that basically is not very common to observe in OT, and that if you observe it, might actually give you some hints of what the actor is, is trying to do. So, okay. The first thing for hunts and detection is uh, to know who has to do it, who and why, because we are aware this is fairly specific. I know some of you might be just learning about something different and just never going to use this, but some of you that might ever run into it or are already running into control systems and trying to work with it, you're going to find it especially useful. So, who has to care about this and start thinking about threat hunting and detection and whatnot? First, of course, any asset owners, any, any one of you that works specifically with these type of devices, mainly if you see those type of Finale Electric, if you're using the protocols we mentioned, the products we mentioned, that's you know, the, the first use case. But the second one is, of course, uh, if you're curious. Maybe you have a good sample of information, you want to play with it, you want to see what there is. And what we're going to suggest in a second is not only for in-controller, it's for actually any type of OT malware. So, you know, you might be able to use it. Hopefully, you'll find something amazing and let us know. Uh, for challenges, challenges for these type of, of detections, though, like, like one thing to clarify is, first of all, uh, the three di different tools, right? Like we're not talking about just one single tool that we can go and look for it. We know they're different. They could be used together, separate in different parts, at different levels of an organization. So it's fairly chaotic to go and try to identify it. Second thing is, uh, I mean, yeah, presumably leveraged with ITOT. So you're going to have to see some of the, of the steps from the actor that might be using entirely different tools uh, that might come from wherever you least expect it that have absolutely no relationship to this. And the other thing was uh, the Python, which starts coming in here. Uh, since the code is developed in Python, it can be uh, deployed or executed in different ways. It can come from a command line. It can come in a script. Uh, it can come embedded with something else. So in this case, if you want to try and go and find it, you're going to have to focus instead on the behaviors rather than uh, itself on, on, on basically a sample. Even if you have all the hashes for this, it's not really going to help you. Because most likely when the attacker develops it, which is the other point in here, they are going to modify how it was, how it's developed, it's already public, and you can use it in different ways, and you can extend, depends on the victim. Basically, it is fairly complicated to go and find a precise match. So what to do about it? Um, the first thing, or how actually, this is, uh, I highlight, uh, once again, this, this last portion is from, from, from Ken's amazing work. What he was highlighting is that um, what we want to do is sort of, or recommend, is to set a trip wire. Basically, the idea is that oftentimes when the actor comes and tries to interact with the OT, they're going to be using very, fairly common um, features, let's say, that in IT are very common. You're going to see them everywhere, for example, a ping. If someone's pinging around, it could be okay. But if you're seeing that in your controllers, then it's going to be weird. And actually, in these cases, as, as we mentioned a couple of minutes ago, both in code call and omshell, the actor has capabilities to do ping sweeps. So if you go and find those kind of like lazy steps that they use for reconnaissance, for finding the details, you know, for starting the attack, you might be able to identify the attack much earlier than, you know, by the time they, they get to actually use it. If they get to use it, you already lost. So basically, that's why it's also so relevant. So we focus here on uh, behavior-based. Uh, another thing is uh, focus on key systems we mentioned here. What we, mentioned, what, what we refer by to key systems is, since we have all this large organization, all these different areas where you have to look for, for data, it can come with many different tools and whatnot. What we're suggesting is to focus specifically on uh, controllers, HMIs, and whatnot, specifically that are critical for the process. So as you're going to see, when you're talking about industrial, it's not only about the hunting itself, but actually, you have to be very familiar with how your process is running, what devices, what is going on in there. 
So I know that this is a, a very big challenge at the organizational level. Uh, we always get into those, those, those talks with uh, different organizations and whatnot. But yeah, that's, that's basically the way to go for it. So that's why it, it's a challenge, basically. And then finally, um, collections for embedded devices. This is actually my favorite in here because one of the things that we work a lot with in OT is the fact that some of the devices is not, you don't, you don't get what you see. You get what you see and whatever it's inside. It can, it can be running different types of uh, software, firmware. It can have different components uh, internally in a, in a product you're using. And so working with these type of embedded systems is often difficult. You also have like different um, ways to communicate with them. Some of them might, you might only interact by cable. Some of them you might have to go and physically interact with them. Some of them might have a software suite. There's just so much of a variety. It's not like, like how you can interact with your computer. You have to go and learn about each of them. And that is such a challenge that actually uh, in earlier this year we presented this, uh, that's the DFIR framework for embedded OT systems from Mandiant. We presented it this in S4 conference in uh, January or February. I don't remember, beginning of the year. But um, basically, what we were trying to do is saying, OK, we know that you as an organization are having a hard time because all of these different products that have different capabilities, that have, you know, that everything is different in industrial. So let's try to put some order so that you are prepared for whenever an IR comes or whenever a threat hunting process comes and whatnot. So what we actually do is, as you can see here, we have there the process for incident response. We focus on preparation, and at the preparation level, we suggest th three things. The first one is as simple as identifying what tool, well, basically what you have, what tools you have to interact with it, how do you get access to that device. Simple, sounds simple, of course, it's a ton of information. The second one, collaborating with the equipment manufacturer. So if you need more information, you need a specific, a specific tools, whatever. Sometimes, for example, the specific vendor might have tools to interact with your controller quite directly and you might as well take them or otherwise invest 10 years in building something and you know lots of money and whatnot. And then finally, um, data identification and collection. That's when you actually pull the data, you get some baselines, you start to set up everything that you need so that whenever you see a change in how your controller is working, then you know that there is something going on. It is not as obvious as you would do with uh, other type of logging. Uh, we're going to have some examples poked from the internet, but uh, very minimum. So if you're curious, this is a blog. You, you can go and find the, the, the specific uh, framework. But what we, did, what we did for this is actually use a framework. This is the first step. And basically, in this case, what we tried to do is apply this for, uh, for the specific case of controller by separating the three different uh, tools that we have. In the tools, if you mention, if, if you realize that we have, in this case, it's kind of hypothetical, obviously. It would be specific for a specific environment. But we separate first on what are the assets. We include in the assets the specific ones that we so targeted. And the first one, we have OPC endpoints and servers. Basically, this first column is what can in controller touch? Where can it be, where can it have an effect? The second column is the data that you can look at. Uh, in this case, for example, we're suggesting tools and methods to gather these Yarns and Yaras um, Nort. Uh, I think we have some examples with Sysmon, just because it's uh, free, it's simple, it's easy, we love it. Uh, but basically, you know, you can use whatever you have internally. For example, for OPC, uh, it depends on what you're using. If you're using, for example, a very popular one is OSI Soft. Uh, this work was based mainly on that, but you can have from different vendors that have different tools on how to pull the data, what data they have, how do the logs look like, and, uh, well, you can also go from logging, for network traffic, but not very similar. This is place, the, what, what, what we just mentioned, but place kind of like we started looking at the organizational level. Where would we be looking for each of the different things? This is basically just like, like giving a high overview. And then we go into the specific for, I was just checking, I'm good on time. Uh, then you go into the specifics for each of these each of these different levels. So, first, that that was the the the, the, fir the first point for for hunting. This actually is a reference to a to a uh, I, I don't know if saying terrible or very good movie yet. I have to watch it. Um, but basically, it refers anyway. The the point is uh, Python. What I was mentioning a couple of minutes ago. Python is not very commonly seen in at the um, industrial level is something that probably there's no reason for you to have at your plants and if you have it you should you're probably aware of it so just by finding one of these events where you identify that there is any python activity you might already be knowing that something like this might be happening 
it is it is actually you know like what we have been seeing in in, in industrial malware recently all of them have some similarities and then this for example because of how easy it is to to use let's say to deploy then it's being used by by actors for, for this type of malware so if you find that activity that is something that you might be uh, wanting to take a look at the image is not nothing realistic like it's not in control of traffic or anything so uh, it's just basically like an event where you where you use Python um, and yeah anything that that is um, and anything specifically in a set of OT products, if you see the, the rule in the end, like for example that OT products, it, you would have to select which are the ones where you want to see it because otherwise it's going to be a ton of um, a ton of noise. We are aware. If you're at the IT level, it's going to be everywhere. It's definitely useless. If you're in a very specific set of assets where you know it doesn't exist, which is this OT prod, then that is where, where we would be suggesting to hunt. And basically, any derivatives, for example, of that when it might be trying to pull updates or trying to set up for installing anything, those are the things that we will be looking for and that an actor might have to do because, you know, if they want to run something in an environment where it doesn't belong, the first thing you do is update whatever's needed, get to the version you want, and then you start running whatever you have. The second one, just uh, specific now in the, at the tag run level, uh, specifically for, for one of the ones we use, the image, the example you see here is more based, what I was mentioning, kind of an, an OC software specific, but there might be different products, they might look different. Uh, the big learning in here, try not to get too much in the weeds, is simply that it's gonna be tricky to understand what is going in here. Uh, all of them are gonna look different, so you're gonna have to be familiar with uh, what solution you have, how it looks like, and uh, most likely you're gonna be having to work with the engineers, the people that are working directly with these solutions to make sense of, of what is going on. And again, you're gonna be looking for any type of modifications and any type of weird traffic, uh, particularly in OPC UA. Um, one of the big things that we had in, in, in OPC UA pre precisely was the ping sweeps. So that was what we were mentioning a second ago with the tripwire. If you see any of these ping sweeps, normally, and this is from, from experience from our peers that have been working in, for example, a specific industrial facilities to keep it broad, uh, one of the things you, you, that, that happens is like, hey, uh, there was a ping, what happened? Okay, there are many ways to verify. First of all, should it be? Is there anything scheduled? Because everything is scheduled in one of these, uh, one of these locations, obviously. Um, well, it's the, normally they, they have those practices. The next thing you, you would do is probably you can even check uh, physically, like did this person uh, use their key card to go and go to this location and use this, this specific asset? So, you know, is Joe poking around? Yeah, yeah, he is, okay, cool then we know that it's gonna, be, it's gonna be okay. Otherwise, that's something that you definitely should be looking for. And, uh, well, here we have the, the rule. It's very similar. Again, if you realize there's this focus, uh, and this is uh, super like in bold, OT prod. This is something that, the, the rules are very simple. This is something that probably you're using everywhere, much more specific, much more complex, but that is precisely what we want to highlight. That with something very simple, if you place it in the location where it matters, it would make a significant difference for OT. Then cold call. Uh, as you can see, there, there's already this, this, this pattern um, of, of how we're, we're approaching it. Particularly for cold call, what you see in here actually is, is, is very funny, but it's just like, it's basically dorking, like searching a bit around Google, finding some of the manuals from the manuals, you go and search, and then actually this is, you find forums for help and things like that. That's the only way where you can go and learn about this or having the device and playing with it. So here the big learning is uh, it's going to look very similar. Again, look in the very specific assets, you know, very similar. But the thing that's important here is that oftentimes you're not going to be able to understand this type of logging as easy as you do with, with other type of computers, basically. So most likely you're going to have to collaborate with the engineers that are familiar with this type of data. If you see it, it might make no sense. Uh, it depends, again, specifically on what device, what is it that you're using. Again, some examples here. Uh, you're you're going to see this, this pattern of knowing what clients are communicating because another factor is that oftentimes the clients you have, uh, you only have a limited set of clients that are, are supposed to be communicating in this industrial facility. So if there's any, anything communicating via those ports to, let's say, in this case, the specific code call assets, basically the other ones that we mentioned, then basically that's when you should be worried about. And once again, this is relevant just because we have these very specific patterns of communication at the industrial level. If it was to be seen in IT level, it would be a very different story. Omshell, 
pretty much the same. Uh, the only difference is here we have also a couple additional protocols to look for. And since we have HTTP, we're also focusing at the, at the post level. So we're also finding there, for example, any user agent with Python, which again, uh, some people might think an actor would never use it, but some people might have seen that actors use it. So it is something that you can find whenever the actor makes this, this small, uh, let's say, lazy step, not, not to call it a mistake. And well, this is, this is more. Again, these are some logs, actually. Uh, just another example of how uh, basically the logs that come might not have a lot of sense unless you're familiar with the technology. So that is why you're going to need to work with your, with, your, um, with your engineers that are familiar already with this type of specific home-run Ethercat products and whatnot. So that being said, that's, that's the last that I had. I tried to run a bit more right now because I was seeing I was getting close to the time and I want to make sure uh, not to keep you here like until the last minute. But um, the last thing is just, and this is more like a responsibility, the general mitigations. This is basically, as you're going to realize, everything that everyone tells you for OT. Segment everything. Don't keep it together. ITOT. Enable logging whenever possible. Allow listing everything that, that, you know, that, that you're going to be using. All of them are true. And you should follow them. And they are super recommended. But that is the reason why we brought this additional section on the hunting. Because we know that even if, if you follow all of that, it's going to be great, a great baseline. But whenever you find this anomaly, uh, this uh, additional, um, let's say, malicious software that was deployed or whatnot, well, basically, you're not going to know. Because these best practices are great, but are not enough. There has to be some, some proactive additional research. And with that, I wrap up with a, a gift for, for, for our peer, the one with the snakes. He took an image particularly for all, for us. It's a snake on controller, a very bad joke, but it had to be our way to finish. Uh, and yeah, that, that, that's all for now. Thanks. <laughs>